All we had to do to win was to talk over the heads of the premiers, over the heads of the multinationals, over the heads of the superpowers, to the people of this land. Well, I am trying to put Quebec in its place, and the place of Quebec is in Canada. We now have a charter which defines the kind of country in which we wish to live. Why would you extend that? Just watch me. Just watch me. The most unnecessary statement he ever made. Truth to tell, from the very moment he arrived among us, we could never draw our eyes away from him. Justin and Sasha Trudeau regret to inform Canadians that their father went on a September of 2000, the most elegant, complex, charismatic performer in the entire sweep of Canadian politics was making the last sad, necessary appearance. Well, he helped shape the country and he was a great statesman. He was a man of vision and he had the courage of his convictions. And I think it's sad for people because that little bit of passion, that little bit of something so special, something now that we've all lost. He just created in me a great desire to be a productive Canadian. This nation, Canada, the undemonstrative, halted under the spell and sorrow of this one man leaving us. Why? What conjured that extraordinary feat of attention and respect? Because from the very first day Pierre Trudeau debuted on the public stage of Canada, we have been the spectator participants in one of the most transformative performances in the entire life of the country. He was a man of many guises, in calm, the reflective visionary, in crisis, an ardent champion, at times the playful charmer, but always and essentially the voice of who we are and what Canada can be. The greatest Canadian, he would have declined the question. We're living the answer. stretches from the Atlantic Ocean there are now about six of the Pacific Ocean Canada. from sea Both to sea from igloo to, to penthouse when it's lunchtime in Vancouver it is already supper time in St. John's Canada before Trudeau we were a nation submerged a shy place off the sight lines of the world the more complete story of the beaver why not contact the Canadian we government? were still emphatically a dominion Day commemorates the birth of Canada as a nation and the first independent country within the British Empire. Reality TV of the time was our pet, Juliet. Love is just around the corner, any cozy little corner. Hey. Hey, look at our tax policy. Louis Saint Laurent was dozing in Ottawa. Ottawa was dozing in Ottawa. Mr. D did a turn. And then along came that nice Mr. Pearson. Uh, of the party, uh, shall I say. But there was a totally unpredicted springtime about to explode. Say goodnight, Juliet. Good night, everybody. And welcome, Pierre. The great play of our times had begun. The party was on. Trudeau walked onto the national stage in a burst 
of charisma and color that left Canadians twirling in disbelief that this, he, was happening here. I was asking myself, well, you know, is just this another, am I just another Beatle? And I don't uh, disrespect the Beatles. It was hard to tell the pop stars from the politician. The crowd swarmed, the women swooned, and the young were mesmerized. gave his signature to the country during the 68 campaign. He performed the idea that politics was life and, oh horror, fun. <laughs> politics are fun, and that's why we are in it, and that's why we are happy to participate in the running of this country. But the fun is over. You're now going to hear the main speech. <laughs> the Lenz and Trudeau began their long and mutual fascination. Trudeau, the bachelor sports car driver, frequently escorts some of the most ornamental and intelligent women around. The romance was on. The man with the rose had arrived. We were mesmerized, delighted, wooed, amazed, and won. I've got a crush on you, Pierre Trudeau. Although your hair's getting thinner, my majority winner. For you, I'll be sinner and wench. Now, not even Pierre Elliott Trudeau could flirt his way into office. Behind that sly, shy grin was another quite different persona another dimension, in its way more durable and even more powerfully attractive. Trudeau, the hints were early, was a thinker on fundamentals. I stand here as an individual sharing with you the desire to tell governments, all governments, that the basis of their action, the ultimate test of whether they succeed or not, is what they do for human beings, what they do for individual people in society. On sex and the law. The view we take here is that uh, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. The nature of Canada. For many years, I've been fighting for the protection of individual freedoms against collective tyranny and for a just distribution of the national wealth. The swiftest debut in Canadian politics, from novice to prime minister, almost overnight. Everyone was asking, where did this guy come from? What had he been up to? Mainly, in that interesting Trudeau manner, getting ready, reading, traveling, writing, thinking. He was an intellectual nomad. As a young man, Trudeau was fundamentally curious and adventurous. He pared himself down, taking only $800 to travel the world for a year. He was a daring traveler and a bit of a chameleon, Pierre of Arabia. He wanted to encounter the world, not stare at it. Those travels were a phase in a most original apprenticeship, a hike to some really important ideas. I feel that by traveling, I've come to the conclusion that the world is such a diversified place that we need institutions that are democratic and uh, forms a government which permit the coexistence of various ethnic groups, uh, various linguistic communities, and so on. In the middle of campaign 68, he sounded the themes of Canada's future, the outlines of a radical reshaping of the Canadian way. Canada must be unified. Canada must be one. Canada must be progressive. And Canada must be a just society. He knew we were a country not yet hardened into an old-fashioned nationalism. But Canada was both a place and an idea. We didn't know it then, but he was chipping the tree and marking a trail. I'd rather be the man for tomorrow. Today's already half past. The man for tomorrow, I suppose, is the man who's trying to think a little bit ahead of his time.
between yesterday and tomorrow, however, there was the business of today. As the drama changed, so would the man. binge of good feeling about itself during 1967, during Expo. It was Maple Leaf Fever set to music. On another platform, perhaps we didn't want to hear it, there were stirrings of a more ominous note. Canada singing happy birthday to itself when in stomps the Eiffel Tower of French statesman General Charles de Gaulle. And he's not here for the cake or the sing-along. Vive le Québec! Vive le Québec libre! Aside from the insult, what he was really saying is he knew how weak we were, how soft, and how ripe for the mischief of nation-breaking. The cry itself was ludicrous that he knew he could make it, that was the alarm. It would take a year, but the man who would really answer to go and knew what form a real answer would take, showed up on another balcony in Montreal. The symmetry was Shakespearean. On the very night before the vote of the 68 election, under a hail of stones, bottles, and screams from the nationalist St. Jean-Baptiste parade crowd, Pierre Trudeau showed he had the right stuff. There he is. The others are nervous. They should be. Trudeau's security are in a panic to get him out of there. They reach for him. He's not going. Monsieur Trudeau insists he veut demeurer sur place. That's not a playboy on that balcony. And it's not a philosopher either. That's a guy who doesn't like threats. The rose has steel petals. This guy's a fighter for Canada. Just watch him. Well, I am trying to put Quebec in its place, and the place of Quebec is in Canada. Trudeau learned the hard way that backing off never stopped the bullies. As a boy, he learned from his father how to box, overcame his timidity. His will was never in question, and submitting to bigger boys because they were bigger was never a question either. Many years later, the courage he had learned and the sense of principle, which was always his, would meet a test far more drastic than the sham battles of the schoolyard. Separatism had taken a real hold in Quebec. Its advocates were passionate, but there was among them those who took the cause to a place Canadians have rarely contemplated. The FLQ idea of argument was the bomb in the mailbox, arson, and soon enough, the manufacture of at least one Quebec widow. Bomb disposal squad worked through the early morning hours searching for booby traps. Canada has had its first diplomatic kidnapping. A senior British credit official... On October 5th, 1970, the FLQ kidnapped James Cross, a British diplomat. Overnight, Montreal and Quebec were plunged into the kind of drama no one ever dreamt of occurring in Canada. Then, five days later, they kidnapped a native son, a man known to Trudeau, Pierre Laporte. Okay, from the FLQ with and seven days after that, poor Mr. Laporte was found stuffed in the trunk of a car, dead. And I can't help feeling, as a Canadian, a deep sense of shame that this, this cruel and senseless act should have been conceived in cold blood and executed in like manner. 
I want to express to Mrs. Laporte and to Mr. Laporte's family the very deep regrets of the Canadian people, of the Canadian government, and our desire as Canadians to stick together in this very sorry moment of our history. What could you tell us, Mr. Thomas, about the kind of people you're dealing with? I can't tell you anything more. Terrorism is a continual upping of the ante. From mailboxes to murder, the FLQ were true to form. The October crisis was a test. Was this to be the coin of the new politics? Were violence and murder to displace tolerance and the ballot as the levers of change in Canada? Were the bandits of the FLQ to be accommodated? Trudeau knew these were the questions posed. The government has announced that the armed forces will be used to supplement the RCMP. I am speaking to you at a moment of grave crisis, when violent and fanatical men are attempting to destroy the unity and the freedom of Canada. That image of the dead Laporte is the bitter opposite of the idea of Canada. And the October crisis, the test moment for Trudeau, the fighter. If a democratic society is to continue to exist, it must be able to root out the cancer of an armed revolutionary movement that is bent on destroying the very basis of our freedoms. Trudeau had the mind to know what was at stake, the courage to go the limit to obliterate it, and the readiness to act with all the instruments at his command. For that reason, the government following an analysis of the facts, decided to proclaim the War Measures Act. It did so at 4 a.m. this morning in order to permit the full weight of government to be brought quickly to bear on all those persons advocating or practicing violence as a means of achieving political ends. There are very few times in the history of any country when all persons must take a stand on cr critical issues. This is one of those times. No, I, I still go back to the choice that you, you have to make in the kind of society that you yeah, live well, in. Well, there's a lot of bleeding hearts around who just don't like to see people with helmets and guns. All I can say is uh, go on and bleed. But it's more important to keep law and order in this society than to uh, uh, be worried about uh, weak-kneed people who uh, don't like the looks of, uh, of a soldier. At any helmet. cost? At any cost? How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. We watched him, all right. And inside Quebec and all over Canada, the people knew they were watching something very special. Trudeau knew that terrorism, adjusted to, tolerated, or negotiated with, was the negation of the idea of Canadian democracy. He acted with great cost to his reputation in some quarters and with terrible nerve. But at the end, Terrorism never scarred the landscape again. We may never know what we were spared by the High Wire Act of that year, Quebec as the Northern Ireland of Canada. Trudeau buried terrorism with the War Measures Act. The longer battle with separation featured an honorable opponent. René Lévesque, the idea of a nation of Quebec had found its perfect vessel. Lévesque was passionate, intellectual, populist, famous and loved. He was also a magnificent and spontaneous platform speaker, modest and appealing in manner and utterly convinced of his cause. Ce pays du Québec viendra uniquement quand une société adulte, confiante en elle-même, l'aura approuvé par une majorité claire et démocratique dans un référendum, comme nous l'avons promis. His election as premier in 1976, the first Parti Québécois government with the weight of office behind the dream of separatism. Four years later, the planets had aligned. It was separatism's golden moment. 
Fortunately for us, it was Trudeau's finest hour. Eh bien, nous ne laisserons pas mourir ce pays, ce Canada, cette terre de nos aïeux. Nous allons dire à ceux qui veulent nous faire cesser d'être Canadiens, nous allons dire immensément non. We are here today, meaning Canada, because the only other Quebecer of that generation, at least Levesque's equal in passion, but possessed of a larger dream, made the case for Canada. These people in Quebec and in Canada want to split it up. They want to take it away from their children. They want to break it down. No, that's our answer. And no to separatism it was. Trudeau had forestalled the nightmare of all our hearts, the ruin of Canada on the rocks of separatism. Take a look at the streets of Canada, and what do you see? Diversity seems a paltry word. This is modern Canada. That's Trudeau Street. That's his vision in action. The greatness of the Trudeau performance comes not just in his capacities as a warrior against this country's dissolution, but as the architect of its future. It's a Canada where we want freedom and justice for every individual, every man, woman, and child, regardless of race, of color, of creed, of language, or of ethnic origin. A Canadian can be at home in any part of this vast land. Trudeau's vision of Canada didn't flash from the sky. He'd traveled a lot and thought even more. His thinking looked outward, not back. At Harvard, there was a badge on his wall which read, Pierre Trudeau, citizen of the world. It was an early cue. Trudeau saw Canada's future in like terms. Canada was a country of the world. Being a citizen of the world also meant being a witness, closer to home, of the harvest of violence and mayhem that scarred our neighbors to the south. By the late 60s, America's cities were a cauldron. The moment called up its profit. I have a dream. My poor little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King has been shot in his hotel. He died in a hospital emergency room almost an hour after being shot. King's assassination staggered and sorrowed the world. It occurred on the very night before Trudeau spoke at the 68 leadership convention. We know that even that most favored people suffer from external conflict and internal division. And the tragic events that began last night with the assassination of Martin Luther King and which have degenerated into today into strife and arson and hate and murder is a tragic reminder of that reality. This is what Trudeau set out to avoid. He knew from both study and experience that tolerance is not an accident. It is something which is built. For me, this beautiful, rich, and energetic country of ours can become a model of the just society 
in which every citizen will enjoy his fundamental rights, in which two great linguistic communities and peoples of many cultures will live in harmony. C'est ça, le Canada. The first step Trudeau took to building this idea of harmony was bilingualism, with correcting the absurdity of a unilingual state, unable or unwilling, to speak in their own tongue to a third of its citizens. If we can't operate even within our own province in our own language, then what the hell are we doing in this country? Bilingualism put an end to that question. Language is a bridge to tolerance. Understanding and appreciation of others is the highway. Trudeau's multiculturalism, made policy in 1971, wasn't just a tinsel of photo ops and boy scoutism. It re-engraved the templates of the Canadian identity. When we started with, say, bilingualism and multiculturalism, <coughs> what we were trying to do was to make sure that every Canadian could see this as his home, and that every Canadian could say, there's a place where I wouldn't mind living or where I would like my children to be able to live and work, because this is an exciting and dynamic place to be. Trudeau had established the twin vectors of modern Canada, that we are an officially bilingual, culturally pluralistic society. He was now set to pursue the kernel idea of his vision. In the murky four days before Trudeau, the great arch of Canada's legislative existence was the dusty parchment of a venerable archaic document, the British North America Act. Is this physically a, a larger or a smaller act? Medium, Medium size. Yes. Yes. yes, 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 yes. Our constitutional babysitter was the indifferent Parliament of Westminster. We couldn't care less, economically, politically, or in any other way, what you do. It's a, it's a Canadian constitution. What's it doing in Britain? Trudeau was different. He didn't wander into the prime minister's office and look around to see what might be done. Unharnessing our constitution from Westminster's haughty disinterest was a life's goal. In his own large words, it was his magnificent obsession. We know that the constitution is a shield a shield which protects us all, a shield which will protect Canada and Canadians so that they can work with unity towards this just society. Trudeau knew the provinces and the ever-changing cast of premiers would resist any resetting of Confederation's basic understanding. If you're asking me to deliver before you, you deliver on the things you say you're going to do, then we, our problems are still here. Hey, you haven't delivered anything to me. That's right. You haven't delivered anything. No. I haven't asked for anything yet. I've got a second list, like from Elevate. <laughs> Nonetheless, he fought for it with tenacity, cunning, and patience, and won. <laughs> we finally achieved our full sovereignty only after Trudeau's arduous, artful, and dogged struggle. April 17th, 1982, is the founding day of this country. My wish, My wish simply is simply that the bringing, that the bringing home, home of our, our constitution, constitution marks, marks the end of a long winter, is now the breaking up of the ice jams, and the beginning of a new spring. Trudeau had performed a piece of Canadian magic, extracting our sovereignty from the vaults of Westminster and giving us the very instrument of our civic modernity, the Charter. We now have a Charter which defines the kind of country in which we wish to live and guarantees the basic rights and freedoms which each of us shall enjoy as a citizen of Canada. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms is the document of a nation that hopes to give itself a conscience. It is the text, the great code of this country's civil values, of individual and group rights, 
the centrality of tolerance that defines modern Canada. It is the inscribed writ of Pierre Trudeau's central vision. <laughs> However grand the vision, the visionary must engage. Trudeau knew he had to hold his audience. His style was the motor of his accomplishment. He was abrasive at times. And don't throw weed at me either. I didn't get into politics to be insulted. It's just what I call political stupidity. What is the nature of your thoughts, gentlemen, when you say fuddle duddle or something like that? God, you know. Sometimes rude. You can stick it where you want, what I said. Don't ask me questions if you don't want my answers, you creep. Come on, go and look for some job. Get up, your ass! Let's get on to the questions, see if we got any intelligent ones here. And other days when he was gracious. Right, how about a great cheer for President Reagan? Hey, come on. And yes, even playful. But he was never, he was outside all the known genetic laws, boring. He kicked every cliché about gray, bland, dull Canada out a really tall window. We found it all so refreshing. Just watch him indeed. In that decade and a half, he burned his way into the consciousness of Canadians. His gestures made headlines. His offhand remarks became buzzwords. Trudeau was a complicated guy, a combination of fighter and artist, visionary and rebel, solitary and thinker. The public role imposed many personas. The return to private life beckoned like a holiday. It was a dark and stormy night. It really was. Trudeau, like no other, knew how to end the scene and make an exit. When he decided to leave politics, he went for a walk in the night. Solitary under the falling snow, he was composing another Trudeau moment. Decide in a snowstorm, announce in the morning. It had the neatness of a cameo. As he looked out over the convention and the bittersweet farewell to his party, he sounds the undersong of his entire public career, the theme beneath every variation. I realized that if our cause was right, all we had to do to win was to talk over the heads of the premiers, over the heads of the multinationals, over the heads of the superpowers to the people of this land, to the people of Canada. Our hopes are high. Our faith in the people is great. Our courage is strong. And our dreams for this beautiful country will never die. Dreams for this beautiful country. And then, with a familiar flourish, a half turn, and that shy grin, the dreamer leaves the stage. Here, Trudeau's departure from politics was as clean and abrupt as his arrival. The man who had been the signature and icon of Canada in the modern age, while he would vacate the television screens and front pages, was now fixed in a more durable gallery, the Canadian imagination. He retired. He never left. A few of his perpetual opponents thought that Trudeau offstage was just a relic, that age had robbed him of relevance and passion, that his bond with Canada's citizens had dissipated or was hollow sentimentality. Wrong. When that great confabulation by the moonlit waters of Meech Lake produced the now forsaken accord, 
Trudeau saw it, despite the opposition of nearly every opinion maker in the country, for what it was. 1987 Accord is unlike the Parsons egg. It's not only bad in parts, it's completely bad. I think it should be put out on the dustbin. I, for one, will be convinced that the Canada we know and love will be gone forever. One passionate warning, and suddenly, bye-bye, Meech. It was an astonishing illustration of his sway, this performance. Even in retirement, Pierre Trudeau, on the questions that mattered, was the one voice that mattered. Who speaks for Canada? After politics, we knew of only one passion, his dedication to the boys. We saw it in every glance and gesture. His sons were his heart. Pierre Trudeau, doting father. It deepened our relationship with him, these offstage glimpses, continued the story, kept us in thrall, and cut the deepest. Word of a tragedy in British Columbia tonight. Police say Pierre Trudeau's son is presumed to have drowned. Michelle Trudeau was part of a group It is of the darkest Canadian curse a parent can carry to lose a child. An avalanche yesterday pushed the four people off a mountain trail. He was genuinely old himself now, near to the final page of his own story. This cup more bitter simply by virtue of that fact. It drained him. Emerging from the church services, supported by others, the one image we have ever had of him, reduced, shaken, and frail. As always, we watched. One grief will follow another. The passing of his son and his own struggles with Parkinson's disease wore him out. Pierre Elliott Trudeau died on September 28th, 2000. And once the news had settled in, there began that extraordinary outflow of respect and farewell. I found myself thinking about what Mr. Trudeau had given the country in terms of his vision. I wanted to say goodbye to something that's very important to our country. He evoked emotions, feelings. He made me proud to be a Canadian. In the way of such things, his passing brought into focus how much his achievement and personal example had modified and vitalized our national idea. He taught us to believe in ourselves, to stand up for ourselves to know ourselves. The common mood from town hall to the peace tower was in that lovely place halfway between goodbye and thank you. I see in Canada now and much more in the future an evolving society in which two great linguistic communities and peoples of many cultures will live in harmony. For me, that is Canada, c'est ça, le Canada. Who speaks for Canada? He was elegant, intense, brilliant, and passionate. The most luminous presence on the Canadian stage in a century and a half. His legacy is unparalleled. He deepened and enriched the idea of Canada, reframed our values, and reordered our laws. Who speaks for Canada was the question he left singing in our minds. We do, of course, all of us. Better and deeper now because Pierre Elliott Trudeau so superbly called us to reply. We speak for Canada. Just watch us, Pierre. <laughs> 